السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. الحمد لله حمد كثير طيب ومبارك فيه والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد. First of all, inshallah, please excuse me. I do have some sinuses. Inshallah, the pollen has been sprinkling like snow, so it's it's going to take a little while for me to recover from this. So please excuse me while I you know wipe my nose and all this kind of stuff. Inshallah, while we're sitting here. Uh, inshallah, we're going to be finishing up the last portion of uh, Surah Abasa. These are ayat 33 to 42. We talked about the first uh, two or three passages, two passages, I believe. Uh, the beginning of the, the surah, how it was revealed concerning the incident uh, with uh, Ibn, uh, Ibn Maktum, radiallahu anhu, the blind uh, companion, who, again, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa because of his uh, interruption, while he was giving da'wah, he frowned and turned away from him. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately went into the major message of the surah, which is, the rejection of the disbelievers, uh, of the idea that there will be a resurrection, excuse me, and a life after death. So they rejected this idea, and this is the real message of the surah, and the introduction is just used as an introduction to bring the topic to, to, to hand. And this is the last passage of the surah, that before this we talked about, you know, Allah is drawing attention to uh, the, the creation, right, of, of the plants, and how they come about, and the different types of vegetation that we have, and we saw a video about, you know, just how the plant actually grows. So just so we could kind of see these things. Right after this, Allah Azza wa Jalla, says, فَإِذَا جَاءَتِ السَّاخَ يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْمُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِيهِ That when there comes the deafening blast, on that day, a man will flee from his brother and his mother and his father and his wife and his children. And this is continuation of uh, an earlier passage when Allah Azza wa Jalla is censuring those who reject the uh, possibility of life after death. And Allah Azza says, when it comes, meaning it's definitely going to come, a sakha. And a sakha is a deafening sound. Something that, a sound that is so loud that it causes the ears to go deaf. And this is referred to the second blast of the horn, which will bring people back to life. So we talked about the first blast that will take light. And this is now, Allah Azza is talking about the second blast that is going to bring people back to life. فَإِذَا جَاءَتِ السَّاخَ And he says, يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِي these are very, very powerful ayat, right? So Allah is telling us what's going to happen on that day when the blast is sounded and people come back to life. Uh, it's going to be a very chaotic time. And Allah, as he mentions, on that day, a man will flee, run away from his own brother, his own parents, and even his wife and his child or his children. He will leave them and run away. Now, when you think about these relationships you have in this dunya, right? In an ideal situation, uh, your brother is somebody you grew up with, right? Your siblings are people you grew up with, and even though you may have, you know, uh, arguments and fights with them, when, when push comes to shove, you stand up for them, and you're willing to, to do a lot for them, right? Your parents, again, Allah has how many times has told us, you have to do good to your parents, you have to do good to your parents, you have to be there for them, you have to serve them. Your own wife and children have rights over you, right? Your spouses and your children, they have rights over you, and, and you're supposed to be there for them, and you spend, and this is the closest... A relationship, the strongest relationship that a man has with any other people in this world is with his, the people that he lives with, is his wife and children. And you don't expect that these are people, when they're in trouble, that you would run away from them. Right? In this dunya, no matter what is happening, these are people that you will run towards if they're in need of anything. But on that day, the chaos will be so severe. Right? The, the situation will be so severe, your own needs, your own uh, uh, decision, your consequences, whatever is lying in wait for you, that fear will be so deeply ingrained that a man will run away from these people who in this life, he actually runs to in order to help them and save them. We, we sacrifice ourselves for these people in this dunya, but on the akhirah, in that day, nobody is going to give any help to anyone. They're going to be running away from these people. And the word firar is used, and it's generally used to escape from something that frightens you. So when you see these people, you will actually be scared of something. And what is it you'll be scared of? The scholars, they give a couple different interpretations. Uh, if it's referring to the mushrikeen, then maybe their own family members that had accepted Islam, because they will see the punishment that they're in. From the moment they're resurrected, they will flee from them. Because they'll be scared that, so I don't want this to happen to me. Right? Another fear that people will have is that I owe people certain rights. I did things that were wrong to them. You know, they may want something from me. And out of the fear of losing their own good deeds or, or being engulfed in their bad deeds or their evil, they will be running away from each other. And uh, they will run away, as we said, from their closest relatives. And the way people will be resurrected on Yom Al-Qiyamah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi mentioned in the hadith of Aisha where he said, تُحْشَرُونَ حُفَاتِ الْعُرَاتِ الْغُرْلًا 
فقالت عائشة رضي الله عنها فقلت يا رسول الله الرجال والنساء يذنون بعضهم إلى بعض فقال الأمر أشد من أن يهمه ذلك. So عائشة رضي الله عنها she narrates that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said you will be resurrected حفاتا عرات غرلا barefoot naked and uncircumcised in your original state that you were brought into this world. And then she asked يا رسول الله the men and the women will both be resurrected in this fashion and they'll be able to see each other. And the Prophet Sallallahu replied, the, the situation will be too severe for them to think about that. So not just the fact that your own family is there, you're running away from them. The fact that even people are standing in this, uh, in this situation, you won't even notice that. Right? And the next ayah of the Quran, Every person that day will have a matter that will keep him fully busy. Right? The Prophet Sallallahu another hadith, he said this, uh, that, that ayah as a reply to this question. That people will be so engulfed so uh, busy with the things that they have to deal with, they're not even going to notice what's going to happen. So we're going to be resurrected in this fashion, and this is going to be the state of some people, most people, who will be running away from people that they even recognize and would generally uh, run towards. Um, after this, Allah says, sorry, uh, an interesting thing that comes up in the books of Tafsir is, who will be the first people to run away from these uh, situations, right? The first one to run away from their mother, their, their father, their child, but these are things that are mentioned in the books of Tafsir, so they have some value, they've been narrated, they've been passed down again. We don't know the authenticity of these narrations. They're, they're found in the books of Tafsir, and it's just interesting. Right? It's interesting to kind of see, uh, because these are stories that are mentioned in the Qur'an. And so even this ayah kind of refers to all these stories that are mentioned in the Qur'an. So Al-Hasan al-Basri mentioned that who was going to be the first one to run away from his brother? He said Habib from his brother Qabil. Right? Qabil killed uh, Habib, right? Came to the, Qabil killed Habib, always mix, mix that up. Qabil killed Habib, and Habib would be the first one to run away from his brother. He said the first one to run away from his mother and father would be the Prophet Ibrahim salam. The first one to run from his wife, uh, Nuh and Lut salam, because we know what happened with their spouses, as is mentioned in Surah Nuh and other portions of the Quran. And from his child, Nuh salam, right? And we know that the son that didn't come on the ship with him. Uh, Qatada, another one of the, the scholars of Tafsir, he mentioned that uh, as for the brother, it would be Habib from Qabil, right? So pretty much the same thing. As for the mother, it would be Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Again, this is narration that he has. Uh, and as for a father, it would be uh, Ibrahim running away from his father, alayhi salam. The, uh, the one from the wife would be Lut, and the one from his son would be Nuh, alayhi salam. But again, the general understanding of this ayah is that a person will run away from his own family members because of what he is uh, scared of. And that's the, the better understanding, that rather his own parents. And this kind of goes from the the weakest of these relationships to the strongest of these relationships, right? So it starts off with your brother and your siblings. The parents are a stronger relationship. And then it goes on to your wife and your children. These are even more stronger relationships that we have, right? These are, this is the strongest relationship that we have. This is the bond that creates a family that then creates, you know, parents and brothers and siblings and so on and so forth. So it's like Allah is uh, saying that you are not going to be worried about anyone, even your own brother, even your own parents, even your own families. Right? It's just getting it more and more severe, showing that you are not going to be concerned with anyone but yourself. And that's the general understanding uh, of this ayah. And interestingly enough, even the Prophets, والسلام, most of them, except for Rasulullah we'll see in the hadith next, they will also be concerned with themselves. And there's a long hadith, and you can see that long hadith, inshallah. But I will read it, and this is a very important hadith. It tells us what's going to happen on the Yom Al Qiyamah when people are resurrected and they're standing. And they're waiting. So a lot of times we have this understanding that, okay, we'll be resurrected, then we'll form lines, and then we'll start our hisab, and then, you know, we're going to go, you know, to Jannah or Jahannam, whatever is going to happen. But the reality is, it's going to be a long, long period of time where people will just be waiting. They will just be waiting for everything to start. And in this time, which can be thousands of years maybe, again, it's, it's no, knowing what's going to happen, but eventually there will come a time where this will happen. So the Prophet Sallallahu he said, I shall be the leader of mankind on the day of resurrection. Sayyidu wa the Adam. Right? Sayyidu wa the Adam. I'll be the leader of mankind on the day of resurrection. And he asked his companions, Do you know why? And he said, Allah will gather in one plane the earlier and the latter of all human race, meaning all the people, the early, earliest generations and the latter generations, on the day of resurrection. Then a voice of an announcer would be heard by all of them, and the eyesight would penetrate through all of them, and the sun would come near. Right? So this is something that the Prophet is describing. The angels will be you know, speaking, there will be sounds, there will be people that will be overseeing, watching, and the sun will be brought near. Again, this is something that's going to be recreated, it's going to be brought near, and the, the heat of the sun will also serve as a punishment for some, even on, at that point, on the plane of resurrection. He said that people would experience a degree of anguish, anxiety, and agony which they shall not be able to bear, and they shall not be able to stand. 
So some people would say to others, do you see the kind of trouble we are in? Don't you see what has taken over us? Why don't you find one who shall intercede with you, with your master, with your Rabb? And some of them would say to the others, go to Adam salam, And they would go to Adam and say, Ya Adam, O oh Adam, you are the father of mankind. Allah created you by his own hand and breathed in you of his spirit and ordered the angels to prostrate before you. So intercede for us with your Lord. Don't you see the kind of trouble we are in? So they go to Adam salam, beseeching him to move things forward. Let's, let's, let's get past this point that we're in to move things forward. Uh, Adam would say, Verily, my Lord is angry, to an extent which he had never been angry before, nor would he be angry afterward. Verily, he forbade me to go near that tree, and I disobeyed him. I am concerned with my own self. Nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. That's the word in Arabic that you're saying. Nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. So I'm just worried about myself because of that sin that I, or that, that mistake that I made. Right? Nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. Uh, go to someone else, go to Nuh. They would go to Nuh alayhi salam and they would say, Ya Nuh, you are the first of the messenger sent on the earth after Adam alayhi salam. And Allah mentioned you as a grateful servant, Abdul Shakura, intercede with us for thy Lord. Don't you see what kind of trouble we are in? Don't you see what has overtaken us? Again, he would say, Verily, my Lord is angry today as he had never been angry before and will never be angry again. There had emanated a curse from me, which I cursed my people. I am only concerned with myself and you better go to Ibrahim alayhi salam. So the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam made the dua that he had to قَالَ uh, Rabbi in uh, uh, the last ayat of Surah Nuh or the last ayat of Surah Nuh but he basically asks Allah to not leave that other عَلَى الْأَرْضِ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ دَيَّامًا right? to destroy all of his people because they have rejected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he's worried about that now that he uses dua to cause the destruction of his people and then he says he'll go to Ibrahim alayhi salam so they would go to Ibrahim alayhi salam and say you are an apostle of Allah messenger of Allah and a friend amongst the inhabitants of the earth Khalilullah Intercede with us for uh, with your Lord. Don't you see the kind of trouble we're in? Again, the same thing. He says, he will say to them, Verily, my Lord today is angry as he had never been angry before. And will never be angry afterwards. And Ibrahim would mention his, his, his uh, three uh, lies that the Prophet mentioned that he had to, had to say. He would mention those. And he will say, I am concerned only with myself. I am concerned only with myself. Nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. You better go to someone else, go to Musa alayhi salam. Then they go to Musa alayhi salam, the same thing happens, and Musa alayhi salam says to them, by the same thing, my Lord is angry like he's never been angry before, and you should, uh, he said, in fact, I had killed a person whom I had not been ordered to kill. Again, the, acts, the argument that took place, and he was, he was uh, forced to go defend somebody, and ended up killing the person. And he said, I am concerned with myself, you better go to Isa, Jesus, peace be upon him. So they would go to Isa alayhi salam, and they would say, Ya Isa, you are the messenger of Allah. You are the one who converse with people, who talk to people in the cradle. You are the kalima to Allah, the word of Allah, which he sent down upon Mary, Maryam alayhi salam. And you are the spirit from him, ruhun bin. So intercede with us with your Lord. Don't you see the kind of trouble we're in? And he would also say, he will simply say to them, I am concerned with myself, I am concerned with myself. He did not mention anything. That what he's concerned with, he was just saying, nafsi, nafsi. He says, you better go to somebody else. And then they would go to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and the Prophet said they would come to me and say, O oh Muhammad, you are the messenger of Allah and the last of all the prophets. Allah has pardoned thee or pardoned you all of your previous and later sins. Intercede with us with your Lord. Don't you see the kind of trouble we're in? And then he say, I shall take, I shall then set off and come below the throne, the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Again, how all of this is going to happen, we can only imagine, right? We don't know. But he's going to go below the arsh of the of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he will fall down in sajda and prostration before Allah. And he, Allah will give him words of praise that no other person has received before. So there will be new revelation, right, to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, on the day of resurrection, which is a beautiful thing. Allah is going to reveal something to the Prophet وسلم, words of praise that have never been revealed before. And then he would say, Ya Muhammad, raise your head and ask and it will be granted, intercede and intercession will be accepted. This is Allah saying to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, I would then raise my head and say, Oh my Lord, my people, my people, Ummati, Ummati. Right? His concern is not nafsi, nafsi. His concern is Ummati, Ummati. That my people, my people, my followers, uh, he's worried about them. Then Allah Azza wa Jal, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu then said, uh, sorry, I lost my place here. My people, my people, it would be said, Ya Muhammad, bring in by the right gate of paradise those of your people who would have no account to remember. No, la hisa, right? People that would enter Jannah without any accounting. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to make us amongst those people that will enter Jannah, inshaAllah, without any account. That they would share with the people some other doors beside this door, meaning they could go through other doors. And the Prophet said, By him in whose hand is the life of Muhammad, swearing by Allah Azza wa Jalla. 
Verily, the distance between the two doors of, or the, uh, the two door leaves of, the, uh, of Jannah or Paradise is as great as the distance between Mecca and Hajar or as between Mecca and Busra. Right? He's talking about the width of the actual door that opens up. Right? The thing that you open up, that door, the width of that door, the Prophet said, will be as big as the distance between Mecca and Hajar or Mecca and Busra. And Hajar is on the eastern side of, the, the, of Saudi Arabia. And Busra is uh, in Sham, basically Syria or, or Lebanon, north of, of Mecca. So this is a beautiful hadith that tells us, you know, some of what's going to happen on that day as well. Besides just the chaos and this and that, there's going to be people rushing and running to the prophets of Allah, all of them turning them away, eventually finding the Prophet وسلم, asking him that he's going to make sajda, and again, it's going to be a long thing. It's not going to be immediate. These things are going to take time. But then the Prophet at the end of it all, also he gives us, uh, you know, he's, he's giving us a great lesson, right? He's telling us what's going to happen. Prepare for that day. Inshallah, we want to be amongst those that will enter Jannah from the right gate of paradise without any hisab, without any account. And he also gives us a little bit of insight, right? Because uh, we are people that like to know details. So he tells us that the width of that gate is going to be like the distance between Mecca and Hajar and Mecca and Busra. And this is what I wanted to kind of show you as well. This is a glimpse of the Afrah that we're inshallah get to see. You can kind of imagine. So this is a map <laughs> of where Mecca is. And Busra is where you see Bahrain, right? That's, oh, sorry, Hajar is the area, the province towards Bahrain. And this is over 800 miles, right? So this is the size of the door that the Prophet ﷺ told us would be the, the, uh, the entering door of the Jannah for the people that will enter without account. And Busra is up north where you see uh, above Jordan between Damascus. Uh, that's the town of Busra. So it's, it's either this or this big, right? So you've given us an approximate size. It's pretty much the same size. Uh, of, of, of the doors and just for a different perspective if you were in space you could still see this distance right so this is a huge door and one of the things again just pondering over this hadith this is not something that's a there this is just me thinking and pondering but when Allah Azza wa Jal has made you know something so grand right something so amazing and he's given us the hint that by the way the door to Jannah is this big right now doors generally you know how many people enter through doors how do they how big do they have to be how big should they be, right? What, is it just a grand nature or is there some kind of message? Allah, Allah knows best. But inshallah, we can maybe hope that inshallah, there will be you know, lots of people that will be entering Jannah with our hisab, inshallah. And we ask Allah Azza wa to make us amongst them because this door is big and the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jalla is the greatest and there's no limit to His mercy, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So because He's made the door so big, inshallah, we hope that you know, it will be there so that millions and millions and, and lots of people can enter bi'ithillahi ta'ala and we ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to make us amongst them as well. Uh, moving on with the, the, the surah, Allah then He says after you know uh, that uh, the ayat that talk about uh, uh, the people running away and going this and this. Then He talks about what what else is going to happen. Right? There's two. There's going to be two camps of people uh, in general, and He mentioned this in the previous surah, surah al Naziyat as well. So for every person that day will be a matter that is adequate for him. The translation doesn't really give the meaning. It's, it's every person will have something that will keep him busy, that will keep him from worrying about somebody else. No one is going to worry about anybody else. If these come after the ayat of your brother, your parents, your wife, and your child, because if you're not concerned about them, you're not concerned about anybody else. Right? So you will only be concerned about yourself. You will be busy in your own uh, issues. Wujuhu yuma ibn musfirah. But some faces that day, Allah Azza wa says, they will be radiant. Right? They will be beaming, radiant. And laughing and rejoicing. Laughing, I mean, people will be happy. So on that day when people are resurrected, not everyone is going to be in such an anxious state. Right? Some people are going to be happy, rejoicing, because Allah is, is giving them hints and He's creating within them the emotions that he, these are signs that they are going to have a good end. Right? So people will be happy, laughing, and they'll be radiant. So there will be some kind, type of nur, some type of radiance, emanating from these people, we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us amongst them. And then he says, And some faces that they will have upon them dust, right? And a kind of darkness will overcome them. Some type of darkness will overcome them. This is the last ayah of the surah. They are the ones who are al-kafara, al-fajr. The, the ones who disbelieve, the ones who deny. And al-fajr, the ones that are wicked, the ones that are involved in all types of sins and all types of wrongdoing. So Allah Azza wa Jal is describing people into two camps, and He does the same thing the Surah Al-Nazi had before, right? The Surah right before this, 
where he says, uh, As for the one who transgresses and prefers the life of this world, then the, the hellfire will be his resting place. But as for the one who is fearful of the standing before his Lord, uh, and he prevents himself from his own desires, then that will be the person whose uh, re residence will be Jannah, or the paradise. And here, he mentions two camps as well. People that will be happy and rejoicing, and people that will be, you know, covered in dust and darkness. So again, these are the symbols of the two types of people. This is how these people, the people that are described in Surah al this is how they, they will be resurrected. The ones going to Jannah, inshallah, will be happy, rejoicing, laughing. And the ones going to Jahannam will have a sign of humiliation on them. They will be covered with dust. They will have this, like, this, it's described as like a veil of smoke or something, this type of darkness that will surround them. And Allah describes them as they are al-kafaratul fajala. They are the ones who are the deniers and the, the ones involved in sin. The interesting thing here that some of the Mufassirin they mention, why in Surah Al-Nazi'at did Allah choose to mention the people of Jahannam first? And the people of Jannah next. Like the ones who transgress first. And then he said, The ones who fear the standing before his Lord. And in this surah, he mentions the people of Jannah first. Right? And then he mentions the people of Jahannam next. So there's a switch here in the order in which they are mentioned. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, you see, because this surah started with the mention of a righteous person. The mention of Ibn Umm Maktoum, Abdullah Ibn Umm Maktoum radiallahu anhu, the righteous Sahabi, the companion of the Prophet sallallahu he came to him seeking guidance, and Allah says, if man yakhsha, the one who comes to you seeking, you know, he's fearful of Allah, and he's running towards you, uh, what will make you understand that he might purify himself? Whereas in Surah Al-Nazi'at, the, the starting of the surah talks about people who rejected the hereafter, right? So the focus point was the rejection of the hereafter in the beginning of the surah, so that's why they're mentioned first. And here the focus was in the beginning, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Sahabi, the blacks, and since he's been mentioned first, Allah Azza mentions the people of Jannah first, because their qualities are being mentioned first throughout the surah, so it kind of stays within this, this flowing theme of the surah, and it's opposite of the previous one. So this is kind of an interesting point that we have as well. So it's different in the previous surah, the order, and in this surah, it is different as well. And again, there's a comparison that is being made uh, you know, between the two camps. Right? And both of these are mentioned in both these surahs. So the, the, the characteristics of uh, the people mentioned in the Nazi'at was that they transgressed all limits, they crossed the lines, they disobeyed, they uh, preferred the life of this world over the next, meaning they were easily, they were willing to sacrifice anything for this dunya, not for the next. And therefore, the hellfire will be their residence. And on, it's what Abbasah they're described as being resurrected with their faces covered as dust, as a sign of humiliation and they will be gloomy and dark and sad and not happy, right? opposite of happy as, as the previous things were mentioned. And the good they were mentioned in the previous surah as they were fearful of accountability. The standing before his Lord. right? The standing before his Lord for accountability. They were fearful of that accountability and so they prevented their own selves from their own desires. Right? They prevented their own selves from their own desires. So paradise is their uh, residence. And so the way they're resurrected, happy, joyful, Laughing, right? Radiance, uh, as opposed to you know darkness that will cover those as a sign. So these are things Allah is telling us uh, because you will see them, right? Eventually you will see all of this happen. You will see the plane. You will be resurrected. You will be standing. You will go through. You will see you know the experience of the sun, the people nearby, the anxiety, the whatever that's going to take place, the asking of the prophets to go ahead and move things forward. You know some type of suffering. I mean, Allah is going protect us from that. May He make us from amongst. You know, those will be laughing and rejoicing on that day. But these are things that we will see. So when Allah is telling us these things, these are things that when we get resurrected, inshallah, you know, it's going to come to mind. You know, we, if we go into this life knowing that's going to happen, then when that happens, inshallah, we should be on the right side. That's the whole point of telling you what's going to happen. So these are things you will see. These are, uh, you know, Allah Azza wa Jalla is giving us glimpses. He's even showing us how, you know, the big the door of Jannah is going to be. How wide and spacious that, that door is. And inshallah, we hope that it's wide and spacious to allow multitudes of people to enter. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jalla again to make us amongst those that will enter through that gate uh, without any hisab, without any accountability. And again, as the teaching of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that when you ask Allah for something, ask Him for the best, right? Ask Him for the best. Well, we, we hope and pray Allah forgives us for our sins. But we really hope that Allah Azza wa Jalla, and we pray to Allah Azza wa Jalla to let us in immediately through that door without any hisab, 
and to take us in easily in the, in the next life. But that will take sacrifices, obviously, in this life to uh, prevent ourselves from our desires and to understand that we will be held accountable before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the end of the surah. Alhamdulillah, Inshallah, next week we'll start uh, surah at taqweer uh, surah number 81, inshallah. Uh, if there are any questions or, or comments that uh, everyone has. So. The day they're running away from? The day they will be resurrected. No. Yeah. Where are they running from? Like? They're running from their, his brother, his mother, his mm-hmm. father. So they, you will see the people you recognize as the resurrected. And you will actually run away from them. So meaning you don't want to be near these people. Because you're afraid that either they're going to take something from you, or either they're uh, engulfed in some type of punishment or situation that's not pleasing, and you don't want anything to do with it. So again, like we said, in this dunya, if someone's in trouble, you go and you run to their aid. But on that day, the chaos will be so great that you will actually run away from even your mother, your father, your child, even if you see them suffer. You will run away from them. Meaning you don't want anything to do with what they're going through. You're worried about your own situation. So this is why. He mentions the closest possible relationships that you have. Because it's just the, the, the chaos of that day will be, will be so great. Any of the sisters have any questions, please? Please do ask. You know, the, you know, the word used for the right people was some. Like some will be like this. Yes. So does it give the idea that some means few? Or? Uh, no, because uh, again, wujuhun is, is, is uh, indefinite. So it doesn't mean like all of them. So it means portions of them. And again, how many Allah Azza knows best, but uh, it, it gives a meaning that not all. I guess that's probably a better way to, to kind of think about that. Not all of them will be this way, but a portion of them will be this way. But there's no way to determine if it's few or, or many. But we know in, uh, in some of the surahs, uh, I think, one of the surahs where Allah mentions Ashab uh, al-Yameen wa Ashab al-Shimal wa Sabiqoon al-Sabiqoon, right? So uh, there will be like the ones that are the ones that are in, in the front, the most, uh, the ones that try the, the most effort. They will be lesser, in, you know. There will be more of the earlier generations, but lesser of the of the latter generations. And ashabu shibal, ashabu yabin, will be a, a, a you know a good portion of the early and a good portion of the latter generations. So we have just generalities, and again, these are things that uh, uh, we can think about as well. But again, in that day, we just hope that we're amongst those that will be. Smiling and laughing, inshallah. Barakallah. Any, any further questions or comments, inshallah? Yes? Is there any narration which mentions uh, like the number of people going without Hisab is 70,000? I'm not sure. Okay. If, if there is, I'm not sure. But we do have narrations that tell us the, the ones that will be entering the fastest oh. are the poor and the weak. And the ones that you know had more wealth will be held back for more questioning. Mm-hmm. They will be delayed their entry. But the ones that were weak and poor will be rushing and running and uh, you know, they'll be allowed to go much, much faster. So I, I'm not aware if there are any uh, narrations that have that. So. SubhanAllah, so. <laughs> so if somebody could give me a nap, inshallah.